Good morning, colleagues, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, uh, 25th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, Graham Simpson, the convener of the committee, is uh, attending to other parliamentary business this morning and therefore is unable to be with us, uh, and he sends his apologies. Uh, Bill Bowman, MSP, will be joining us uh, when his uh, committee that he is currently in uh, finishes uh, very soon. Uh, he will be substituting for Graham. Uh, so before we move to the main item of business, there is one uh, piece of business that the committee must decide first, and that's uh, on agenda item number one. It's proposed that the committee takes uh, item number three in private. Uh, this item is the consideration of the evidence that we are about to hear on the UK Trade Bill. Does the committee agree to take the item three in private? Okay, thank you. Okay, today uh, we are uh, scrutinising the Legislative Consent Memorandum for the UK Trade Bill, and uh, we have before us, before us today George Hollingbury MP, the Minister of State for Trade Policy of the UK Government. Mr Hollingbury is accompanied by Suzanne Greaves, OBE, Trade Bill Manager, Department for International Trade, uh, Eleanor Beavis, Head of Domestic Portfolio, the Trade Strategy, Department for International Trade, and Rebecca Hackett, the Deputy Director uh, of Policy of the Scotland Office. Mm -hmm. I'll let you take your seat. Yeah. Uh, may I welcome, uh, wel welcome you all uh, to this meeting and uh, thank you for taking the time to come to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I know you've already had uh, a busy morning giving evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee, so I certainly welcome uh, you to, uh, to this committee as well. As you know, the, one of the committee's roles is to look at the all legislative consent memorandums which contain delegated powers and report to the relevant lead committee. Uh, our questions today are therefore focused on the delegated powers uh, in the Trade Bill. Um, I do uh, highlight, though, to that we may stray into some uh, policy areas from time to time, but that is not the purpose of this committee. And, uh, and I will allow some latitude for some questioning, but uh, if uh, if we do stray too further, uh, too far into uh, policy, then I will uh, uh, I will ask my colleagues to uh, to stop that. But uh, I do would like to invite the minister to make a, an opening statement, and after that, they'll open up to questions from members. Minister, well, thank you very much indeed, Kevin, and thanks for having all of us in today. I have to say, this is possibly the most Titanic table I've ever sat at. <laughs> it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, and whilst um, I was. Uh, Dreading would be the wrong word, but was somewhat tense about my appearance in the last committee. This one scares me rigid. <laughs> this is a very technical area. Um, anyway, thank you for inviting me to address your committee today, which I understand looks, as you've already outlined, aspects of the Trade Bill, and will feed back into the Finance and Constitution Committee your opinions, and of course, where, from where I have just arrived. Uh, as I explained to that committee, the UK government wants all parts of the UK to support this bill and we will continue our comprehensive engagement with the Scottish Government to ensure we secure its recommendation for a legislative consent motion. With this in mind, I note the Scottish Government's memorandum on the LCM from December 2017, and of course since then, the UK Government has taken significant strides through its amendments, making improvements to the Bill, and answering many of the concerns that were expressed in the memorandum. Beyond this, I'm conscious that members here today have specific and technical questions, particularly on clauses one and two, uh, and I look forward, along with colleagues, to providing responses as an important step to help deliver this bill for the whole of the UK. Uh, I would just finally reflect, uh, Kavina, as I just mentioned to you in our private conversation, uh, that uh, this is a technical area. There will be times, undoubtedly, when officials are better placed than I am to give you full answers, and I hope uh, members of the committee will allow me to do so, and I think they will actually simply get better answers. Thank you very much uh, for your opening comments, Minister. And uh, yeah, certainly we, we've got no issue uh, at all with uh, your colleagues uh, in that particular area. Um, so I'll open up um, for question one. It's, uh, it certainly appears that, uh, that the general intention behind the powers in Clause 1 to implement the government's procurement arrangement, sorry, agreement is that the UK would continue to be an independent member of the agreement. The dele delegated powers continue to be an independent Sorry, the Delegate Powers Memorandum for the Bill explains that the power is required uh, to reflect any changes uh, indeed, is there any changes needed as a result of the process whereby the UK becomes an independent member. Can you explain the scope of the powers uh, that, would, uh, that would be available to the Scottish Ministers, 
uh, to make potential amendments uh, to the terms of the Government Procurement Agreement? And could the powers actually be used uh, to implement further substantive changes uh, to the GPA, uh, given that procurement is a devolved matter? Can I, I'm going to go slide across the top of this for a moment and then ask uh, Ellen to, to fill in uh, underneath. Uh, simply, the point of having the powers as they are set in the Bill uh, is to allow rapid response to any changes in the schedules that adhere to the GPA. Uh, in principle, the, the power is there simply to slide across what we have already agreed uh, into UK schedules with a minimum of fuss, such that the delegated powers are there to just take any bits that need changing in three particular areas, and particularly accession to and withdrawal from uh, the GPA, such that it reflects the current reality uh, on, on the ground. Um, is it possible that these powers could be made more uh, used more widely? Yes, it is. Um, but it is absolutely our intention, and I can say that publicly here today and put on the record, that the government is not, is not going to use the powers for that purpose. It is our intention to move this agreement across such that it can be used in its current form in the UK on a legal basis. Uh, and do you have anything to add? Yes, um, I, I'll run through the, the scope of the Clause 1 powers now, if that's helpful. Um, so um, it allows for changes um, of our domestic regulation to reflect our UK's, the UK's independent accession to the GPA as we leave the EU. Um, as the Minister referenced, there will be no substantive changes um, as we accede to the GPA on the same terms and with the same coverage as we have now. Um, the power also allows us to um, uh, update um, our, our measures as new countries um, indeed exceed or withdraw from the agreement um, and um, it allows us to update Annex 1 of the GPA which is the list that covers what entities are covered by that agreement. Um, so for example when that agreement was made the Department for International Trade didn't exist so we will need to do some technical updates to make sure that list of entities um, is factually accurate. Um, just on that, uh, also it's in the previous committee uh, there was quite a a wide discussion uh, around uh, clauses one and two. And uh, so one aspect that was raised earlier, which certainly has an impact in this particular line of questioning too, is the, uh, is, uh, is the, the, the aspect of the, the Scottish ministers uh, having any type of uh, input to, well, to, to engage with that, that particular area. And, uh, and there seemed to be some, um, you know, some dubiety in, in that area uh, of, uh, of discussion. I think your, your officials this morning, Minister, mentioned that there have been uh, regular and wide discussions between at, at uh, official level, but not at ministerial level. And so, will Scottish ministers and with this Parliament uh, actually have an opportunity to uh, to help uh, shape uh, and uh, and uh, this particular uh, area of discussion? Are we talking about specifically about GPA? Yes. In that. As far, okay, and again, I invite officials to jump in and save me at any stage. Uh, we are transitioning across the agreement which we currently carry, uh, on which basis any changes that are being made are simply to make the powers that currently exist through the EU available to British institutions through the, uh, through the UK, uh, on which basis any decisions that Scottish ministers have already taken in using that power are already made and are already there, and the powers that they had before will still be there. I think that is correct, in which case I think my steer has been from the beginning that the Scottish Government was content with us re-exceeding or transitioning across the GPA agreement, in which case I wouldn't anticipate that there was any need for ministerial level contact on this in that we are simply enabling Scottish ministers to be continue taking the powers that they have previously had. I, I believe that to be the case. Okay. okay. Neil? You didn't your officials jumping in to save you. Maybe we could get some officials to jump in and save the Prime Minister, but maybe I don't. I think that might be a stretch too far. <laughs> well, uh, let's not go there, please. Um, in terms of the um, the way in which the government has handled um, the whole issue around devolved powers, um, has, I think many of us would believe in across parties that it's been a pretty disastrous approach and we're now heading for the Supreme Court. Um, consent is vital going forward so that we um, provide some certainty for businesses and for workers and, uh, and jobs that uh, people who are feeling very, um, uh, their position is very precarious. So um, 
as we go forward and regulations and uh, devolved powers come forward, um, how is that mechanism going to, uh, to how, what mechanism is going to be there? A for consultation and B for disputes. And in which particular areas are we focusing on? Well, it, all of them. I mean, if we're talking about development frameworks, if we're talking about new regulations coming forward, if the, if these are coming forward, what discussions um, with the devolved administrations? How, is it, how are they going to take place? And secondly, if there's if there's differences of opinion, how is those how are those disputes going to be resolved? Okay, so I'm going to narrow my comments down to just the, to the bill. Uh, which I think is what I'm here to talk about, but I, but I take your point, Karina, that the uh, wider questions come up, and I'll refer, if I may, to Rebecca. Uh, these things will relate to trade. Uh, of course they will. I, I understand that. Uh, we are conti continuing to work on how we discuss trade issues. It's a reserve matter, as we know, to the UK. Uh, officials meeting officials on a regular basis to talk about the existing memorandum of understanding, concordats, and so on and so forth, and to see where we are in that the process, process of development of those. And in fact, Rebecca just spoke a little earlier uh, about where, roughly where we are with, with that process. So there's a lot of work going on uh, as to how those frameworks are created, the mechanisms by which we talk with each other, uh, the various commitments the UK government makes to the Scottish government about trade and international relations and how, and how we deal with those. Uh, as to the bill, it, it oh, sorry, sorry, the, the the next part was, was about um, free trade uh, agreements. Um, clearly, there is going to be a lot of interaction with the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government, uh, and indeed with officials, uh, as we move forward with developing our ideas about how we negotiate the free trade agreements with the four partners we, we've identified. We are absolutely clear that there should be real deep and meaningful consultation with the Scottish Government, that we should be open on our side to modifying our proposals based on the information we receive, and I'm absolutely committed to that. It seems to me that we will get much improved uh, and much more deliverable uh, free trade agreements if we can all agree on exactly what they should uh, they should end up uh, proposing uh, and indeed how we negotiate them. Quite what that mechanism is going to be in exactly and in, in fine detail is yet to be resolved but you have my political commitment that I believe it is absolutely right that the devolved authorities should have a very real input into this process. Uh, and already there are many meetings, uh, there are specific meetings, I'm having one later on today, uh, on free trade agreements with, with the government minister. Uh, it, contact is happening at every level. I think there's a degree of certainty that needs to be provided to that, which we will provide in, in due course. But as to the wider issue of frameworks, disputes, mechanisms, and so on and so forth, that is strictly out with my portfolio, but we do have uh, Rebecca here today who I think can declaim on that a little further. Um, so, I mean, I think on the frameworks um, piece, there's been um, a detailed amount of work going on for um, for many months now at official level, at ministerial level. You have the Joint Ministerial Committee, um, which is chaired by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and that brings together ministers from the different devolved nations to look both at EU exit issues more generally, but also to, to manage the work on frameworks. And beneath that, there is extensive um, official level discussions going on, working through all of the different areas where it's been identified that common UK frameworks might be needed, working through the detail of those, really getting into the, uh, I suppose, the nitty gritty of the policy areas to look at how these frameworks can be applied, whether um, we can be looking for non-legislative frameworks, so cooperative um, approaches like memoranda of understanding and really trying to limit down the number of areas where legislative frameworks might be needed. So there's been um, detailed uh, series of discussions going on um, earlier this year, second round of discussions happening now. Um, and there is a lot of a, a lot of activity there, but it is it is complex work. It is technical work, and it does take time. So um, it's right that we we give that the time that is needed, and um, ministers are are regularly updated, and we'll be um, reviewing that um, later in the year. It's just it's two years since the vote, and um, when we still hear things like in due course, it doesn't provide a lot of certainty. Um, in relation to the question the convener raised, um, um, to try to put some of the technical elements of this into more practical uh, terms. So, for example, the procurement agreement that's uh, uh, that we're looking at taking forward, could it do things like um, allow the Scottish government, for example, to um, not to have a publicly owned railway, to have to not put the ferry ferries to the islands out to tender. Would it allow us, within public procurement, to insist that contractors paid the living wage? 
because at the moment um, those three areas are often uh, it's often EU procurement policy that is highlighted as being the barrier to allow these things to happen. So would the new procurement arrangements in practical terms allow examples like that to happen? I think, Convener, that the, I, the best I can do is to repeat myself and say our objective here is to transition the exactly the same arrangements we have technically changed such that they're operable in UK law. Uh, the, the rules that governed Scottish ministers and indeed UK government ministers previously will be the same in large part but in UK law uh, as they were previously. So is that a no? It's, it's, it will be the same. Any other officials come and rescue you on that one? With, I with can perhaps add um, something <coughs> excuse me, about the objective of the, this government procurement agreement, which is to allow businesses across the UK to actually pitch for contracts um, in other um, countries that are signed up to the agreement. So they get the benefit of um, work, if you like, and contracts and the monetary benefit of that and bring that back to the UK. And also to allow... Um, um, uh, organisations across the UK um, to procure um, public uh, public services from um, a, a wider range, a sort of wider market, and therefore get better value for the public money that's in invested in them. So that's the, that's the purpose of this agreement. It's it's that that's why we want to transition it and still be a member um, in the UK's own right after um, after exit. We, we've procured our. Um rail franchise from a wide EU market um, that currently is a company uh, that's the Dutch uh, government that owns, yet we can't get a public um, a public bid here. So effectively we have a, a railway in public ownership from a foreign country. Would we be able to stop that? I think we just need to return to the reality here, which is that we're transitioning across the agreement as it currently sits. So anything that is not currently possible will not be current, will not be possible thereafter. Is it possible that always allowing, absolutely, Suzanne's point is absolutely germane, access to a $1.3 trillion marketplace out there, uh, would we be able to change things under our own right as we are no longer members of the European Union? Yes, but that is an argument for a different day. What we need on Brexit is to be able to, be, to have for companies to be absolutely certain what the rules are, that they are the same as they were before, such they can understand them and get on with them. If the UK government, uh, petitioned by the Scottish Parliament and others, decides it is the right time and place for us to change the way that agreement works, well and fine. But this is about certainty and it's about continuity and everyone understanding the ground rules and whether there, there may be problems with the EU procurement rules. And we may wish to change them, but we need to do that in due course as we can without disrupting everyone's expectations as we leave the European Union. And that's the whole point of the clause. I, find I, going to, I say it does, I think, have the agreement of the Scottish Parliament. Um, whether that's happened in a formal way is another matter, but I understand that Scottish officials have, uh, have, have indicated to us that, that, that they are content for us to take this view and to work in this way. Okay. Now just before I move on to uh, clause two, does anyone have, uh, have any questions on clause one? No? Okay. Okay, uh, certainly clause two, uh, clause two of the bill, uh, clause actually two section, uh, subsection seven of the bill, uh, is on the implementation of the international uh, trade agreements, and it provides that the power uh, would end or have the sunset uh, clause after three years uh, after exit day, unless that uh, that period is extended by any regulations. Uh, why is it to be considered uh, appropriate that no sunset period uh, should apply to the powers to implement the GPA? Uh, straightforwardly, with the commitment given uh, publicly previously but by myself again that what we wish to do with this is simply make sure that we have a mechanism to reflect accessions uh, and indeed resignations, whatever the technical term, term is for leaving the GPA. It, it seems perverse, I think, not to have that power available to us simply to make that happen uh, for uh, a continuing period. Uh, it is simply an efficient way of doing it. Uh, therefore, I don't believe there is any particular need to sunset it. If we wish to change the GPA, uh, I would suggest to you that there will be other mechanisms by which we would do that, and it would be done with much wider consultation, uh, and, and I suspect it would use a different mechanism for actually applying those changes. So the powers sit there simply to allow us for a period of time to reflect the reality of membership uh, of the body. That is what they're there to do. In terms of the international trade agreements, it's time limited because we can only we are only to transition agreements that existed on exit day between the European Union uh, and the UK, 
and, and therefore it is right that there should be a period in which we can do this, beyond which actually that cut-off point is probably too far away. We started with five years in the bill, as I'm sure you know, uh, and we took the representations from members of parliament and others about how that this was probably too long, uh, agreed that um, we would modify it to three years, and I think that is probably the right balance. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Just as a specific supplementary, I'm correct in understanding it with uh, regards to clause to the sunsetting of three years. That can be extended, is that correct? Could you give some examples just for why you believe that power is justified? Uh, I think it, it, there were arguments made in similar circumstances in, in other forms, the EU withdrawal bill and so on and so forth. I think straightforwardly, uh, to have an absolutely hard sunset, uh, if you are right on the cusp of finishing a trade bill, and you would like to get it onto the books, uh, finally you've reached a point where you can transition the existing agreements. Uh, it seems to me that it would be foolish to have an absolutely hard, hard cliff edge limit, though of course that does help your negotiation. So there's two sides to this argument. Uh, but if it was pretty clear, for example, that an error had been made in scheduling timetables for ratification in a different parliament, you would be able to deal with that and therefore you, you could extend it. So that, that would, in general, uh, it, it's simply about dealing with circumstance as it arises. Thank you. And just finally on that matter, the power to extend by another three years will be available to UK government ministers, I understand, but not to devolved ministers. What was the reasoning behind that decision? Simply because this is in the area of um, reserve competence. It's about free trade deals, it's about international trade, and that is a reserve matter under the Scotland Act. Um, I think that, that that is probably it, though I think it's probably worth noting, I, uh, I am right, and just officials will confirm, that as and when we extend that power, it's not in the hands of ministers directly. Uh, the, uh, a, a, a statutory instrument or a delegated uh, uh, has to be put in front of both houses and passed. Envisage circumstances where it would be necessary for that power to be extended by another three years for specifically devolved matters? For specifically devolved matters. Or how to, for, for matters which um, impinge upon devolved competencies. Um, as I sit here now, uh, I can't think of any particular issue. Uh, I mean, it is, it, is, it is, I'm sure, possible to sit down and write something out where that would be the case. Uh, but I would, I would say to you that this, this, is, this is more about certainty and cliff edge and about dealing with circumstance as it arises than it is about anything substantive about what the UK might or might want, want to do with um, continuity of trade, tra uh, of trade agreements. And then finally, if such a scenario were to arise, would it would be deemed necessary that devolved ministers required an extension, would there be any barriers to that? Uh, devolved ministers required an extension? Yes, for example, uh, supposing a UK government ministers um, were successful in having a SI through the Commons and there was an extension of three years, if there were some hypothetical scenario where there was a requirement for that period to be extended as a consequence of that for devolved ministers, would there be any barrier to that sunset provision being extended by a further three years for um, devolved ministers? I, I'm not, so on the devolved ministers' front, this is... OK, I'm, I have to say I'm slightly struggling to, 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 to get my head around the question, so let's just ask an official if they can do better than I can, which is almost certain, to be honest. So I think what you're asking is if um, we needed to, or if a devolved minister needs to use the powers, yes. would we extend in that case? Is uh -huh. that correct? Ah, OK. Um, so, I mean, we would... The answer is, as part of the kind of ongoing process um, of engaging the devolved administrations in a uh, trade agreement continuity, we would foresee that, um, you would imagine, and uh, we would work closely with the um, with the colleagues to understand whether a sunset was appropriate. Um, and you would imagine, as all of us um, care about continuity in our, you know, on, in our ongoing um, trade relationships, um, that we would be incentivised to, to be as practical as possible in that situation. That's very helpful. I can perhaps add something else about the, uh, the, the sunset and why it might be extendable. So, uh, as the Minister has explained, these are about just continuing uh, the existing trade agreements, and the power allows us to implement in uh, domestic UK legislation any, any changes that we might need to make to reflect the fact that we're taking them on board as a UK only rather than um, as part of the EU. But there might be changes that we would need to make to, to keep those agreements operable over time. So the small changes, but they, and it's still about continuing the effects of those agreements. I, I, I raise a question because hypothetically if a scenario could arise for UK ministers, it may arrive for devolved ministers as well. I'm sorry I didn't understand that, but I totally understand the question now. <laughs> 
it's the technical okay. nature of this committee. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Clause 1, 1 e and F provide that the UK ministers or the, all the devolved authorities uh, also have a power to make such provision as is considered appropriate in consequence of uh, any modifications uh, to the list of central government entities in the GPA uh, to be used after the UK has acceded uh, to the agreement. It appears that modifications uh, could uh, be needed uh, due to the machinery of government changes uh, which is uh, mentioned in paragraph 50 of the Delegated Powers Memorandum. Uh, can you explain further how this power might actually have effect in respect of Scotland? Uh, how might the power conceivably uh, be exercised by the Scottish Government uh, to make regulations in consequence of uh, the modifications to the list? Uh, no, that's right, to Alana. So I'm not an expert on um, Scotland public entities, but I can give you an example in terms of UK government, which I referenced earlier. Um, so the Department for International Trade and the Department for Exiting the European Union, the new, newly established departments, and at the moment aren't included in our list of entities that are covered. These are the sorts of kind of machinery government changes that we would need to make and um, uh, assuming um, public entities changed in Scotland too, um, the same logic would apply. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So um, I accept that you're not a, uh, an expert uh, on the Scottish public bodies, um, but at the same time, uh, they could uh, conceivably come back to uh, the point that, uh, that Tom uh, was raising a few moments ago. There could uh, certainly be points that uh, it would be beneficial uh, if there was um, some type of kind of differential position uh, that the Scottish uh, ministers or Scottish agencies actually uh, uh, would see to be better for uh, for those particular bodies. Uh, so would, uh, would the UK government actually have any uh, any uh, position to be uh, against that type of uh, scenario? Just to be sure I understand, sure. I, 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 you're su suggesting that we might use certain, we, whether, where a name is incorrect or where something has to be changed, there might be a desire among Scottish ministers to substitute with a body in Scotland such that that body, was, we use these powers to insert that name. Is, am I correct in how I assess the question? Um, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that some of the, quite a lot of this is probably a matter of negotiation with, with partners in the agreement about who can and cannot be included and whether or not they are right to be included in that particular circumstance. Uh, beyond that, if officials have more to add, I, I think that is the complication there, that's I suspect, but there may be... And just to add on top of that, obviously, um, as we mentioned earlier, we're approaching our accession to the GPA in a, from a consistency point of view. So we're looking to have the same coverage and um, and accede as, in a, as closely as possible um, uh, in a way that um, replicates our membership at the moment as part of the EU. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Alison? So, on the Clause 2 powers to implement international trade agreements, the UK Government has acknowledged in the Delegated Powers Memorandum that obviously the power is broad enough to allow implementation of substantial amendments, including new obligations. Could you please explain, explain to me what scope is there for existing trade agreements between the EU and third countries to be subject to these changes? You know, in the course of it being adopted in UK third um, country agreements? Well, in the end, we start, it's actually very similar to the GPA. We, we start out with a position that what we're looking to do is create continuity. So, in every case where we are negotiating with partners to roll these agreements over, we will be looking for just that, as few changes as possible to provide certainty. Now, over time, it may be that we have room, capacity, and there is desire on both sides to enter into substantially different arrangements. But I suggest to you that all of our focus should be on trying to create that continuity such that nothing in appearance, feel, and look of, of an agreement changes substantively. That means that there is a very real um, impetus on and uh, a stimulus for the UK government to try and design these these uh, these rollovers such that they have very little in, in the way of change. Uh, and so I would not expect that in the vast majority of cases we would find that there is any substantive difference. Now, if it is the case that there is a substantive difference, uh, one of the changes that was made in the bill was that a memorandum, will, uh, an explanatory um, document will be placed before the House before ratification 
that tells the House exactly how an agreement has changed, where what, not necessarily all the language absolutely, but what all the purposes are of the changes. Further, we agreed with Jonathan Genogli of a new clause six and dealing with that whole issue uh, about scrutiny, that the best way of then laying statutory instruments was to be have an affirmative procedure, such that Parliament has a genuine time to look at it and has to vote on it, uh, and that the explanatory memorandum for each of those delegated uh, of, of those instruments would point absolutely back to the report upon the changes in the agreement and say which of those changes this delegated instrument actually affected. So that will give Parliament very real scrutiny and ability to scrutinise and full understanding of what exactly it is they're being asked to agree to. Finally, at the end of all of that, of course, CRAG has been... Uh, I must forget the entire... Uh, but CRAG A has been uh, amended in 2010 such that the Parliament, Parliament is now capable, um, if it can hold itself together, uh, to <laughs> in, in one cohesive block, uh, to delay any, the ratification of any uh, agreement indefinitely. So there are all sorts of checks and balances uh, at every stage, uh, and we believe that that gives Parliament certainty, gives it understanding, and gives it the right to scrutinise at considerable depth uh, which should allow everyone to understand what changes are being made and whether or not they agree with them. Okay, so following on for that, if I could just go back to the, the scope aspect. You know, what scope is there for these regulations to actually be made by the Scottish Government under Clause 2 to make significant changes in, say, our domestic law? You know, you know if you could think of some examples, you know, of how could these be actually implemented in Scotland, I won't. Get, I can't give you a particular example. Perhaps others can illustrate it a little more colourfully. But the, where there are requirements to implement something in domestic law, that plainly uh, will be the province of the Scottish government. Uh, if this will all be subject to the same, uh, the, the difficulties we've all encountered thus far about Section 12 powers and so on and so forth. Uh, but that that is how the Scottish government will be uh, involved in this. That they will be they will implement the required changes to make this work. Uh, in, in how they see fit in their own parliament, but perhaps Alana would. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to add something. Oh, no, sorry. No, it's just, right. uh, I just okay. asked for a bit of colour, but unfortunately, sometimes in these conversations, okay. it's not always possible. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, could I go on then and just ask you, why has it been considered appropriate that the trade agreements to which Clause 2 actually applies should be implemented by regulations rather than primary legislation? You know, especially, you know, when there appears that at the point of the proposed implementation, agreements in place before exit day might not have been ratified by the EU or substantive changes to existing agreements might not have, you know, have been made. I think I'm right in saying that if it's not been ratified by the EU, then it's not a, an agreement we can transition. Uh, so that, I think that probably deals with that point. Um, sorry, the first part, I've just had a, a moment. I forget, I forget where the first question was. Right. <laughs> Let me start again. No, no, it's sorry, fine. I do apologise. No, no, you're getting a lot thrown at you. So, uh, you know, why is it being considered appropriate that the trade agreements... Have you got primary right legislation. Um, there are 40 agreements we'd like to transition. Uh, there's a little bit of legislation going through Parliament at the moment. Um, I think for pure practical purposes, we need to remember two things. First of all, these are all um, agreements that have been operable in the EU for at least some time, some actually very recently, but a lot for really quite a long time. They've been fully scrutinised before. They are on the books effectively in UK law. Uh, and yes, they may have some changes, but I've outlined the scrutiny that can be involved in that. So these are well understood agreements. They work. Our partners want them. If they didn't, they wouldn't be coming forward. Uh, we wouldn't be able to agree them. So there is no great impetus to have fresh primary legislation simply because they're already existing. They're used and, and they're on the statute book. Uh, and capacity would be a very serious issue. So this, we believe, is by far and away the best way to transition these agreements. Uh, and I think both parliaments can have confidence that they will understand the agreements when they come forward because there'll be agreements on the whole they've been using before. OK, thank you. Oh, please, sorry, yeah. Susanna. Yes. Just one more thing about yeah. what the Minister said about the limitation of the power, and it's, it can only be used to implement agreements that have been signed by the EU, by the by the day of exit. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Is it a supplementary just on this? Yeah, just on this. going to be via affirmative procedure, yeah? Sure. It just um, the advice that we've got is that clause one uh, would be on a, a negative procedure. 
So why is it not affirmative for that? Because there's no issue of policy to discuss. Uh, this is simply about accession to and changing words. Uh, it's it, uh, the whole purpose of this is to bring into UK law what everybody already uses in UK law and what governs UK law, uh, and therefore it is well known and well understood. And what what is being changed is simply about uh, about words that need to be changed, lists that need to be changed, and reflect accessions. And, and so it it is something where it can sit on the negative procedure. Any member of Parliament who feels that there's some problem with this, and I'm not quite sure I can understand what the problems would be, but uh, can uh, pray against, uh, and there can be a vote in Parliament under deferred division. But I think we feel that, that this does not need a great deal of scrutiny. It is simply trying to elucidate or trying to, to legalise a fact uh, rather than putting policy in place. The policy is adopting the GPA. The, this is simply a matter of practicality. We're pretty precious about our scrutiny in this, in this oh, committee. That's fine. Uh, uh, for, uh, it, but if, if, shall we say, um, I can see how certain accessions might be controversial, so I can see why there might be some interest in that. If knows how this is all going to unfurl or unravel, um, then you know, I think that enhanced scrutiny would be um, more welcome. Your point is noted, sir. Okay, Bill? Uh, convener, hello. Um, some explanation on, on some terminology perhaps you can help with. Firstly, on Clause 2, now it might have been some time ago, but the academic experts who appeared before the Finance and Constitution Committee's discussion of the bill on the 21st of February um, raised concerns about the clarity and potential width of Clause 2 as it applies not only to international trade agreements, which are free trade agreements, but also to an international agreement that mainly relates to trade. That expression, I don't think, is further um, defined in Clause 8.1. Can you explain why it's considered that this is sufficiently clear and what, in relation to Scotland, an agreement that relates mainly to trade would, would cover? Uh, I think I'm going to leave this to officials. It's, uh, uh, there, I, I have a note on it, but it's, it, you've kind of been through the elements of it. So, um, quite simply speaking, um, an agreement that mainly relates to trade is one that has trade as its content, the majority of its content. Um, so, it's a fairly simple explanation and an example of the uh, type of agreement that, that um, this could cover would be an association agreement should the majority of the, the agreement um, cover trade-related items. Would we expect any more guidance as to what percentage trade might, um, might take up in that or, you know? I think the it's, it's mainly about trade. <laughs> no, so, so no, I think is the answer. Okay. Well, uh, another one. Let's see how we get on with, with this one then. Um, similarly to Clause 1, Clause 2 enables the Scottish Government to make regulations as they consider appropriate um, to implement the relevant trade agreements. I don't know if that's also the mainly relating to trade agreements, but... Um, why is that, that subject of formulation justified rather than the power to make such provision as is necessary, you know, as they consider appropriate versus as is necessary? <laughs> so I think, I think that's probably a drafting question that we might have to... We'll have to put to parliamentary to. clerks, I suspect. I'm afraid that it, we're getting to... I have to actually asked to go and see the parliamentary clerks to say thank you for the work they did on the trade bill. Perhaps I'll ask them when I go there. But in, in all seriousness, uh, we'll take that, if we may, convener, uh, and give you a technical reply to it uh, by, by letter, if that's, if that's agreeable. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Tom? Thank you, Convener. Um, clearly, there are going to be devolved components within statutory instruments. That's been agreed. We all want this to be as smooth and as efficient as possible and to avoid duplication. Um, what information ahead of the publication or with the publication of SIs Will the UK government be able to provide to the Scottish Parliament, given that the detailed provisions and accompanying and, and explanatory documents that are accompanying instruments with the EU withdrawal bill are with the trade bill? And we're talking here again, uh, again about transitional uh, yeah. trade yeah, agreement, yeah. Trade agreement con continuity. Um, I'll, again, Ellen's had these detailed discussions with, with uh, officials, but my impression is that on the whole, the process that I described to you. Uh, about how we will bring forward the changes and how we will uh, um, describe those and reference them and place them against the, the rubric of the text that says how we've changed it versus the technical instruments that we say uh, 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 are required to change this particular aspect of it should give any observer with access to the parliamentary website more than sufficient access. Now, 
to, to, that, to that detail. Now, if you wanted a, a, a commitment here for, that officials will point uh, officials at this end to the right documents at the right time and or find some mechanism for telling uh, Scotland that these, these issues are arising, I think we would happily commit to that, but I suspect that Scottish officials are already uh, already have those sorts of arrangements in place for themselves. Helen, anything to add? Um, no, I just... It, Agreeing with the Minister that, that as he mentioned, um, the document that we're laying before Parliament will be publicly available and the Scottish Parliament can review it as it wishes. Um, of course, in advance of that, um, we're working closely um, on the trade agreement continuity programme with Scottish Government officials um, throughout. Okay, fine, thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, so in paragraph three, uh, of uh, Schedule 1 of the Bill uh, puts requirements on the Scottish Government to consult with UK ministers in certain circumstances uh, before making regulations. Now, this applies uh, where the regulations would make provision about quota arrangements uh, or which are incompatible with uh, quota arrangements. It also applies where the regulations uh, would be commenced before exit day. Uh, can you explain why the provision for consultation is actually considered appropriate uh, and how, in relation to quotas in Scotland, it's envisaged that the consultation requirement will actually operate? Okay, I think the first thing I'd say is that, of course, this is one of the areas where the amendments were made to the Bill to change this substantively. I forget whether it was seek permission before, it was seek consent. So it was previously it was seek consent and it became to consult. So the UK government has already recognised that this is a sensible area in, in which to change uh, the language in the bill to, make, to, to allow the Scottish Government to control this issue uh, in and of themselves. Uh, I think it is not unreasonable and frankly not, uh, it, it is just sensible for the Government of Scotland to want to consult with the UK Government just to make sure that there isn't some implication that they had, had not thought about. Uh, it doesn't imply consent in any way, shape or form, but I think it probably is just good governance to make sure that actually there's something you hadn't missed, or indeed a plan that is coming out of the UK government, which neither side has yet communicated about, uh, which puts in a potential wrinkle or a complication. Uh, as to the quotas, um, no, I'm not placed to be able to tell you how, how that would work. Uh, I suspect in the end it's the Scottish government making the quotas, so it, it'll be up to them. Uh, but surely consultation applies both ways. Uh, it depending on the circumstance, yes. Okay. Uh, at the, certainly, uh, you mentioned uh, in terms of the amendments uh, that were made at the, at the bill. Uh, at the report stage in the, in the Commons, uh, the amendments uh, to the bill have aligned the restrictions and limitations on ministers' powers uh, with those in the EU Withdrawal Act, and uh, this includes the, the restriction on using the, the powers in clauses 1 and 2 uh, to modify retained direct EU legislation uh, or retained EU law uh, in breach of new section 30A1 and 57.4 of the Scotland Act as inserted by section 12 of the EU Withdrawal Act. Now, the restriction is in paragraph uh, 2 of Schedule 1 of the Trade Bill. Now, surely this is an analogous to Clause 11 of the EU Withdrawal Bill, therefore uh, it being a power grab. I don't believe so. Uh, the simple fact is that as the UK leaves the EU, the Scottish Government will have far more powers than it had previously to control issues uh, which were previously controlled by the EU. There, the UK Government has a responsibility to look after the interests of the whole of the, EU, uh, of the UK, of course, uh, and there are certain issues which are under considerable neg negotiation and which have changed considerably over time, uh, and where both, parliament, uh, both uh, gov governments are having very constructive negotiations uh, about which of these areas should be reserved for the UK to be able to act in exclusively. Um, those negotiations to go on, it's not my job to preempt those. The powers in the EU WA bill and the, section, the Schedule 12 uh, restrictions, uh, I know are contentious. Um, it is not within my gift uh, to, to vary those. It's a negotiation that's happening elsewhere with different officials at different times and have been considerably narrowed over time. That much I do know, uh, such that there are now very large areas uh, of, of uh, competence which the, the, the um, Scottish Government will enjoy absolutely without restriction, uh, and those negotiations continue, and hopefully they will continue further. Uh, but certainly, it's, it is important that the negotiations uh, do continue. Uh, but uh, notwithstanding that, um, there is a, uh, a clear uh, differential uh, of position, uh, and that, uh, that the Scottish government clearly feel uh, that the that power grab uh, is uh, is an operation uh, from the UK government. 
Well, you may call it a power grab. But I, I don't, I'm afraid, agree with that term. It seems to me that it's the right and proper responsibility of the United Kingdom government to, over a period of time, work out how it will deal effectively with the interests of the United Kingdom as a whole single market. It has to make those assessments. It has to be careful uh, not to create dis no, distortions in the UK market. Uh, I don't think that's a power grab at all. I, I think what well, that is is good and responsible government. Uh, in due course, no doubt, these negotiations will continue and the gap will narrow. Uh, and I wish everyone well in concluding them. Uh, and uh, I've got one kind of just final uh, question. Uh, I'll bring in a moment, uh, Neil. Uh, just so just uh, on the, the issue you mentioned a few moments ago, just uh, on the issue of uh, consultation uh, and, and dialogue, uh, and, and this was also mentioned in the earlier session, uh, the, the two part in. Uh, and I think that's extremely uh, beneficial. I know this isn't to do with the trade bill, but it, it generally is extremely uh, helpful uh, that, uh, that there has been more uh, dialogue taking place. Uh, but uh, clearly that's uh, uh, on the backdrop of, uh, of a situation, particularly the GMC process, uh, that has been extremely poor, uh, to say the least. And I know that the, uh, Mike Russell, uh, certainly in evidence given uh, to other committees in this parliament and also in the chamber, he has clearly uh, indicated uh, his frustration uh, at the level of uh, consultation uh, and lack of consultation. Uh, and the, the EU withdrawal letter is a very good example uh, of that that uh, the Scottish Government didn't know about it and or didn't see it until it was actually published. Uh, can you provide a, a commitment today that uh, that, that level of um, dialogue and consultation uh, will be uh, increased, but also that, uh, that representations made from Scottish ministers will actually be taken into account and not just uh, brushed aside? speak for my department and I can only in this instance speak about the uh, negotiation of future trade agreements. Uh, I am absolutely determined, as is the uh, Secretary of State, that the consultations we make will be meaningful, they'll be wide and they'll be deep. Uh, and we will take it to the, into the account the interests of all potential par interested parties, and that certainly includes the devolved authorities. We are not yet set on exactly how we will involve the devolved authorities. That is a matter that's being negotiated on the one hand. And I'll be quite honest with you, I'm not entirely um, at one with the future. I haven't yet absolutely formulated exactly how I want that to happen. And indeed, I, the, the, I need to consult with the Secretary of State. But I can make you the commitment that I believe that we will, uh, the more we consult, the more we listen, the more we integrate the needs and desires, assuming that they don't disrupt other potential partners. Uh, from uh, in devolved authorities, but as, as long as we, the more we listen, the more we uh, integrate, and the more we bring the devolved authorities uh, into uh, agreement with us, the stronger our free trade agreements will be. The more we will be united in negotiating them, and the better deal we will do. Uh, Neil, um, since you're here, Minister, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're a clean living man and doesn't go into a bookmaker's shop. But what odds would you give when the Checkers Plan gets through Parliament? Uh, the government has has put forward what is a credible uh, plan for exiting the European Union. It fulfills all the uh, obligations and promises that the Prime Minister made and the directives that we were following, free and frictionless borders and end of free movement. Uh, I could re recite the entire list, but I think you've all probably read it a couple of times before. Uh, it is the only credible offer out there to try and f finish uh, to, to sort this negotiation out. I believe it has a very good chance uh, of succeeding. Uh, pragmatists across Europe will be saying to themselves, this seems like a, a sensible idea, it solves the Northern Irish issue, it allows free trade to continue, it creates frictionless borders, can we just get on and create an agreement? So yes, I believe there is, uh, there is a force across Europe that can combine to ensure that this sensible uh, and practical proposal uh, comes to fruition. So was that 51 or 20 to 1? Or? Uh, I believe it will come to fruition. Worth a try. Um, uh, it's uh, certainly, uh, Minister, uh, I'm conscious that we have not over uh, the time that was allocated, uh, but there are still uh, a few areas of uh, points of clarification uh, that uh, the committee uh, may well uh, seek from yourself, and would you be content to, uh, to, re to respond to the committee in writing? Uh, Absolutely, writing? of course. If, if, uh, if the committee wants to, the clerks wish to, wish to list the final questions and we can provide written answers to those, of course, delighted. That'd be helpful. And certainly, thank you very much, uh, Minister, and also your team for giving evidence to our committee today. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for having us in here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and with that, I'll move into the private session. <laughs>